Hello YouTube viewers. Welcome to my show Rocket Monday. In today's episode we're going to take a look at is BFR really a Mars rocket? So, we're going to take a closer look at it. So, rockets of the future that we're going to construct and we are working on as we speak, you have to understand rocket can go anywhere. Like you can send even the smallest rocket to Pluto, but the payload size is that's the crucial aspect of it. For instance, like this is India's Mars rocket. Now, it has very low payload capacity to low Earth orbit. However, it did manage to put 1.3 ton Mars orbiter using PSLV, basically Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle. So this is just a demonstration that you can use almost any rocket, which is orbital class, and send almost anything. It's just that your payload will shrink. So if we had used Saturn, we could have gone to Mars with a decent sized payload, especially if it did space docking. So the idea that we absolutely need to have a very, 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 very big rocket is not necessarily true. Second, we come to BFR. The, my last video about that, you can check here. And BFR is SpaceX attempts to make one rocket to rule them all. Now, this rocket is quite capable and it's quite big, but it's, it's still under construction. So we do not know the final specs of this system. And NASA, after the horrible failure that was space shuttle the reason why i'm qualifying it as failure is not because like uh, it didn't work like it did got out of the ground however it uh, had really bad safety record as in two missions blew up and uh, that's below 200 launches so as in one per hundred that's just not acceptable given the fact that it blew up going to low earth orbit rather than to the moon and like we sent people back moon and from and we didn't lose anyone so suffice to say space shuttle was a safety disaster and any engineer will tell you why like there is a freaking hour-long videos about that like why space shuttle was inherently bad so nasa learned their lesson and they are building this what's called space launch system which will compete with bfr now if bfr is delayed they will use this if bfr is early complete then they have to decide whether they will use sls or bfr now they cannot just scrap it because this is already behind schedule for like i think five six years or 10 years maybe this is nasa it's uh, always behind schedule and not when it comes to launches they are behind schedule in projects but never uh, when it comes to launches so this project costs so much money that they cannot cancel it now this is like becoming second james web telescope kind of situation where they have put so much money in that they cannot cancel it like canceling it would be like directly taking a loss of 10 billion dollar or 20 billion dollars so so we have the two rocket system that is almost ready to the go like bfr and sls so what I want to convey to you is very simple. We have the technology. We always had the technology. After Saturn V, we always had the technology. Like technology is not the limiting factor here. So let's uh, dive into the fuel aspect of it. Now fuel has two core components. One is thrust, another is specific impulse. All you have to understand, one is like a horsepower, another is miles per gallon or a kilometer per liter. Now, Thrust is measured in mega newtons or newtons exactly mega newtons just to remove three zeros behind it and specific impulse is measured in seconds and it's uh, basically is that's the mileage of it now think of it this way when you have a heat source like a nuclear reactor or fire or chemical energy you let's say have 3000 degrees celsius what is coming out of that like let's say 300 degrees celsius in your combustion chamber what is coming out of that will determine how much thrust or how much efficiency you have for instance lighter exhaust let's say you have light elements coming out of it you will get a lot more top speed as in like if you fire this rocket in space you will get higher top speed however if you fire the same rocket on earth you may be having a hard time getting off the ground simply because it may not have enough thrust so if you have heavier exhaust you will get more thrust however you lose efficiency so what what are these exhausts that i'm talking about think of it this way like rockets generally either use rp1 or in this context they want to use lng or liquid methane lng is not 100 percent methane you have to add uh, or purify it like it's exactly the same principle as we apply here this is kerosene highly refined lng highly refined will make liquid methane so and this is liquid oxygen we don't have alternate for this yet there was some attempt to make a liquid ozone rocket however liquid ozone itself blows up so it was very risky and deemed uh, unworkable so as of now if these things combined what we're gonna get as an exhaust as in what is coming out of your combustion chamber is hydrogen gas oxygen gas water vapor and carbon dioxide 
Now tuning this ratio gives you the control. Like let's say carbon dioxide is coming out of here, like using RP1. It has a lot of thrust, but it has low mileage. What does that mean? Like let's say you fired this rocket in space from zero to its final velocity will be very severely hampered by the fact that CO2 does not have high velocity going out of your engine because it's a heavier element. So you want to have lighter element. That's why we use kerosene to get off the ground and we use hydrogen when we are in space when there is not enough drag hydrogen because it does not have thrust but it does have higher top speed we get pushed along much further so balancing this things will give you the final output that's why you always if you look into the liquid hydrogen rocket you will always find they are not burning it one to one like you know because they don't want water coming out of it water while it's good gives thrust they don't want that coming out of it they want a lot of hydrogen coming out of it because hydrogen will give you that uh, you know excellent uh, mileage efficiency this was the core reason for space shuttle but as i said if you use hydrogen alone you may not get off the ground space shuttle needed solid boosters so balancing these things will give you the mileage or the thrust and stability matters especially if when you are talking about trips that could last upwards of 2 to 4 years or 2 6 years what do I mean by that? Think of this way. Kerosene, this was a concern with Falcon Heavy when Falcon Heavy upper stage was launched into a uh, very uh, elliptical orbit and trying to send to Mars. There was a risk that fuel, as in kerosene itself, might freeze because space is kind of cold. And you might have issues like this with all of these. Basically, let's say way too much of oxygen starts to evaporate. Let's say there is a solar storm, it starts to boil off your uh, oxygen. You, you can safely vent it out, but you will lose rocket fuel it's like leak, going with a boat that is leaking so it's unstable idea and we do not know how methane will react in deep space environment like uh, can neutrinos affect it can solar flare affect it uh, what sort of things happen so stability is a crucial fact it cannot be ignored you have to make sure either it's properly insulated there are system uh, in place to make sure whether it does not go like you know freeze over or it does not heat and boils off so stability is a crucial factor here so when, then we come to the journey time. What we have to understand about journey time, it's in our hand. How much fuel do we want to burn will give us the final travel time. Generally, generally on average, we have 150 to 300 days. That's your window. Like, can it be shrink smaller than that? Yes, but uh, you have to burn idiotically large amount of fuel. This is what we have achieved successfully. Now, longer takes low fuel. Like, uh, that's why I showed you that uh, India made uh, PSLV was like it was very small rocket so it need, had a small fuel capacity so but we still managed to go to the Mars so if you have longer travel time you can go to Mars on very low fuel but if you you need faster you need to make sure people are not exposed to the radiation of space for very long time and zero gravity of space for very long time for that reason you want to make sure uh, it's fast so we want to try to go roughly 150 days to 90 days that's our target like that's we are aiming for can we go faster uh, not with current technology now solar panels like as they showed in the bfr presentation video that solar array deploys and it is 200 kilowatt of power now be mindful of this 200 kilowatt power i'm not sure whether they are showing it from earth's vantage point or mars vantage point the reason why that matters is that if you take this 200 kilowatt panel and when you go to mars it will lose power one third of its power will be flat out gone not because you know it got damaged or anything like that simply there is less solar flux so generally you have to be mindful of this thing solar panels are not like you know it will work everywhere in the solar system it it has a what we call a, a very bad return on your money so you might have a very big solar panel is giving a lot of power in earth orbit and on mars orbit it barely can keep your life support so and there is no u-turn once you launch there is no u-turn like only in some scenario where you it's not only hazardous risky dangerous and uh, you really don't have u-turn options here so we, let's be frank about it there is no u-turn options properly built into the system so you, once you are launched you have to go you just have to go so let's say we got the fuel we did the journey what about on mars first thing the most crucial thing is we have to make power there if you have enough power if you have enough power source you can terraform or live anywhere on this universe or in this universe to be very exact but question is do you have enough power now many people think we're gonna have a lot of solar panels in uh, mars no 
solar panels will not provide enough energy not to mention they will not provide energy at night not to mention there are risk of what we call nuclear winter grade uh, summer vacations not summer vacation as in like uh, this just happened to opportunity just recently where there is was a dust storm that lasted over a month and we are not stu- sure whether the rover is dead or not but you cannot do that with people you cannot have people like you know their power source is only coming from you know sun and where you have to have gigantic batteries so let's say you made the weight of solar cell very light let's say you made thin film solar cells so you're like yeah i'm saving a lot of money uh, and weight and mass in terms of solar cell but you still need to carry big heavy gigantic battery to make sure it has enough power storage capacity to store energy for upwards of 12 to 13 hours so for that reason, solar panel is flat out out. NASA knows this and NASA is developing these things, what we call kilo reactor. Basically, it's a one kilowatt to 10 kilowatt nuclear reactor. It's working on Stirlin engine. And basically what it is, is just a normal nuclear reactor instead of converting steam and then steam to turbine, turbine to generator, generator to your electricity. It's going radiation, heat, to Stirlinger which is directly oscillating and is giving AC power output and I think they will might have inverters or anything like that to get you the desired output so power flat out we cannot rely on solar at least at the first few stages like we might do solar once we have enough reactors to do our basic uh, life support basic communication all the crucial thing we are sure that our nuclear reactor can handle and we will use RTGs as backup. This is a power source of Curiosity rover. Solar panels simply is not a good idea for first missions. So once we have done them, once we have enough reactor, once we have enough RTGs as backup, then we will use solar panel because let's say the second part will be like make fuel so you can get off of it. Here's the deal, making fuel off of it, the procedure that NASA, uh, NASA and SpaceX is talking about, those procedures are idiotically energy ex- in- intensive. Basically, it takes a lot of energy just to extract CO2 from atmosphere. And uh, you need tons of it. You don't need kilos of it, you need tons of it. Tons of CO2, well, Mars has a lot of CO2, but it's almost as zero PSI. It's 0.0013 PSI. So imagine it's almost, uh, you need to run a vacuum pump there quite energy intensive and you you could be in a scenario where you relied on solar panel and let's say a dust storm happened let's say you had rtg for your people habitat but you did not generate enough fuel to get off like and there is a window launch window as we call it that you have to launch within this time what are you gonna do you're gonna be stranded there for next two years when the another launch window approaches so for this reason flat out solar is not a good idea at the beginning and those of you who are worried about radiation radiation on the surface is so damn high that these radiations coming out of these won't be an issue for you and nobody is saying like put it where you sleep just bury in the ground far off and once let's say we have hundreds of these we can just like once they're supposed to run for 10 years at least so once they have done you know outlived their efficiency we can just crush them and make them into a bigger rtg so we don't have to worry about this and rtgs have been already proven technology for 70 years so we don't need to really do anything about them then we have to make habitat where we're gonna actually live now habitat has to be underground as i specified the background radiation on mars is idiotically high it does not have atmosphere that will slow it down it does not have water vapor in lacking atmosphere so there is no shielding and you have to go very deep as in like one to three meters deep to make sure that there is no risk of radiation so these are your first you make power then you make fuel so you can actually go back then you make sure you have a habitat then you bury the habitat for long-term stay something like that so are we actually gonna do it now there's a few points our priority is not right now as we speak as i am talking to you not to go to mars there is no reason to go to mars there is lack of reasons like uh, the sole reason moon missions even happened was because of cold war Neil deGrasse Tyson did a very interesting video on this and you should watch it. Just type Neil deGrasse Tyson, why we went to the moon. Simple reason, it was a basically who has the biggest gun type of situation. Right now, Mars actually offers us nothing back. And the fact that we can colonize this is a stupid dream simply because Mars is not terraformable. Can we go there? Yes. Can we live there for short periods? Yes. Can we come back? No, we're going to die why now this is very crucial nasa right now is developing what's called deep space gateway or basically it's iss on lunar orbit basically this is their target for 2020s 
uh, till 2030 they will be busy just in this and assuming that their SLS even works at time. So flat out, there is no uh, government or any sort of interest in anything that we actually have to pay the money to go to Mars. Now you might be like private individuals go, no. The sole reason SpaceX even is successfully able to compete in the space market is because it's getting fund from NASA. And those funds are not $10, $20, millions of dollars, sometimes even billions of dollars. And so for that reason, public has to approve of this. It's not somebody like, you know, uh, even Jeff Bezos will not be able to afford. Uh, they may be able to afford the rocket, but rocket is the cheap part. That's the cheap part. You might be like, oh, that's supposed to be the most. No, that's the cheap part asking few people to go on a mission that they may not able to return from and the fact that you have to train them to the best ability astronaut salaries are not cheap and they would they need to be trained they need to be best of the best of the best that humanity has to offer those things are the expensive part so and as i mentioned there is a risk of live streaming that these things will be live streamed nowadays like uh, even iss has an actual active live stream and you can see spacewalks and things like that but when we are sending people to mars there is a risk of death like it's not a uh, going to mount everest it's an actual risk actual unknown now because we are not at a war we cannot tolerate death anymore like we as a society is very pampered we are like death kind of hurts us way too much at this point so asking best of the best of humanity to die like you might be like okay we, we took precautions we do this everything you can do but what if a random small meteorite just crashes through your ship things happen like you have to account for this sort of thing things happen bad things happen and the only one thing has to go wrong and all your crew will be lost permanently. So for this reason, there is a very serious risk that they might be live streaming uh, death people. You don't want that, uh, like, you know, there are cases where in Earth itself, like, you know, somebody accidentally is live streamed death of someone, like school shooting and things like that. Suffice to say, it was uh, painful. So there is a very serious risk of this. And fact that we cannot come back from Mars is overlooked everywhere. It's like the reason we built ISS was to just see what happens to human body when we are at zero gravity. Answer is we die. As simple as that, we die. We cannot live in zero gravity for very long time. Our bones will degrade to a point where our kidneys will fail. Our internal organs will suffer very severely. Now you might say we'll exercise. Exercises only slow down the degradation and sometimes improve the situation of your muscles, but has no effect, no effect on your bones. So unless we have some magical way to make sure our bones don't decay in zero gravity, uh, we did, we can't live for, and that's why nobody is allowed to live in ISS continuously for very long time. And when you are talking to Mars, you are talking upwards of four years or six years. Yeah, suffice to say that's, uh, and even if they survive that, even if they, let's say, we figured out how to keep their kidney clean and like, you know, have enough medical uh, expertise to handle that sort of situation, when they will come back, they will not be able to walk on Earth. Earth's gravitational will would be too strong for them. Now, we are hoping, we are hoping at this point, as I am talking to you, that gravity that is on Mars is enough to keep our bone from degrading beyond a certain point because while we are traveling there unless we create a centrifuge ship that is you showed in the movie Martian uh, we're gonna die just by going there so suffice to say there is way too many things that can go wrong and as a society this cannot be done on some individual nobody has that kind of money to do it personally and if you are asking people to like you know give their money give their tax money this must give something back it has almost nothing should it be done yes but we don't have this kind of uh, tolerant society where we can watch 15, 16 people die or 100 people die or 500 people die or get stranded on Mars because, you know, their plant, uh, you know, malfunction. Things happen. Now, as a, like when we used to be at war, world wars, things like that, we are comfortable with this sort of loss. But nowadays, we cannot handle this sort of loss. So this is the reason why, as I speak to you, I don't think we are going to go Mars manned mission before 2030 at all. Like... There is no plan for it. Now, China can do that. They can risk that. Like, because they have state controlled media, they can flat out risk it and they can go. So, even if they die, they won't showcase it. And if they successfully go and come back, they will be like, yeah. So, if that happens, we're going to have another space race. But until that, yeah, this is not happening anytime soon. It will happen, but not anytime soon. As I specified in my last, last video about BFR, we're going to have at least one or two demo missions. It has to be done just to prove that your rocket can do that. So, this was my presentation of 
our uh, BFR is, is really a Mars rocket. Now, I hope you liked it or learned from it. In that case, please like. If you didn't, don't worry about it, dislike it. And please leave a comment. What do you want to see in next episode of Rocket Mondays? And subscribe, press the bell icon. I make video every day. And as always, thanks for watching.